start tonight with a contentious argument over raising the minimum wage. There's an effort to put this question on the state ballot in November, but the governor says it's not a significant issue for his administration. Joining me now are my contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News, Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. Gentlemen, how are you this week? Well, for the record, I have not stopped complaining about the cold. Oh my gosh, I don't think you're going to stop complaining until it's like April or you May. You can't complain about the cold. It's Michigan. No, nope. not allowed. But this not is allowed. this is extreme yeah, cold. Matter. This is ridiculous cold. And we're, Florida. we are just. <laughs> we should also note that we are also the warm up for Big Buck Night yes, tonight. That's, that's right. right. It's, it's coming a up. Big night here PBS. on Detroit Public PBS Television. Night. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started with the debate over minimum wage that everyone is talking about here in Michigan. We are 7.40 an hour, which is already mm -hmm. above the the federal level of 7.15 an hour. Do you think that this issue is going to get much traction? Yeah, of course. In, in Michigan, no. Yeah, of course, because it's an election year, and Democrats are looking for any issue they can talk about other than the economy and the poor job creation record of uh, the administration and uh, and Obamacare. And that's what this is all about, to distract from the real issue. So yeah, you're gonna hear a lot about the minimum wage. There will be an effort to put it on the ballot. And if it follows past uh, form, the legislature will end up doing some sort of uh, minimum wage hike to keep that thing off the ballot. And, and keep it from impacting voter turnout. Well, let me ask you this, why isn't this a real issue when you have many people who uh, who need to have perhaps a higher wage to be able to invest back in the economy when they're working jobs well, like the, this? The real issue is that we haven't created enough demand for workers and jobs in this economy. Back in the 90s when we had um, pretty close to full employment, nobody was making the minimum wage because the demand for workers pushed wages up. You can't artificially s set the minimum wage and tell an employer, well, here's what you gotta pay, whether you can afford it or not, whether your workers are more productive or not, all this is going to do is throw out more more people from 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 work and from uh, job opportunities. You're going to lay off younger workers. Starting work, um, entry level workers won't have an opportunity, and that's been the history. We now have the highest unemployment among teenagers and younger workers and, and minority workers than we've ever had. Well, unfortunately, you have a lot of people who are working these entry-level jobs who aren't teenagers, and this is not their first job. So do That's you not the majority. That's I mean, not, that majority, not the majority, but, but that all. is the reality for some people. Yeah, that is the, the, the trouble is that uh, you've got people who shouldn't be in those jobs working them, and working them full-time, uh, which is also not the intention, right? Uh, no one should be working uh, at a fast food restaurant uh, as a full-time job. So is raising the minimum wage a viable it's solution? Of, it is part of the solution. It is not the bigger solution. The bigger solution is to address this gap in opportunity that, that has opened up over the last 12, 13 years in this country, which is that you have a lot of people who, uh, who are not qualified for the kinds of jobs that the economy is creating. And so they're trapped in these, these lower paying jobs uh, and working them at, at a full-time uh, pace. There, there are big problems in the way that, that we have grown our economy. If you look at, for example, uh, the growth in the economy just over the just since the recession, you have 95% uh, of the income growth at uh, at the top 1% of the earning scale. That's not it's a, it's a terrible imbalance, and there are a lot of reasons that that's true. Part of it is about the minimum wage, but but that's a stopgap measure because you know, as Nolan pointed out, that's not the way that you you grow the economy. It is the way you ensure minimum fairness, and that's what that's about. Well, you, it, it just doesn't work. I mean, well, it, it ends up throwing more people out of work. The problem is, done, it, I mean, the problem, so do we have a, a wage gap, an income back gap in this country? Absolutely, but it is tied to an education and skills gap, as Steve mentioned. Part of it, yeah. And you don't fix that by saying, okay, well you, well, you don't have the skills this economy demands, so we're going to prop you up with an artificial wage. We need to start addressing the fact that, that we're not training our children, we're not training our workers to do the jobs the yeah. economy so demands. So then do you put the federal money there? Do you put that state money there into the into job training? Well, not into job training, not with this federal government. They, they spend $18 billion a year on job training, and the GAO came out two years ago saying it's ineffective, it's duplicative, and nobody ever tracks the, the results. Well, didn't the president say in the State of the Union address this week that he wants to revamp that? And yeah, he's given he, that job to Joe Biden. How has Joe Biden done on every other special assignment he's given? Actually, Joe Biden's a pretty effective vice president. Well, he, this is like the third or fourth Cheney, time he's giving sure. him a special a special <laughs> job, and you never, have, you never hear anybody coming back and saying, okay, how did he do? <laughs> All right, so let's get back to the minimum wage in Michigan and mm -hmm. the fact that there is a ballot initiative that's starting to get rolling this yeah. week. They have to get between, what, 250,000, 300,000 signatures yeah. to get this on the ballot in November for this to be on a, a statewide vote. Do you think they're going to be able to get enough signatures? Is the is the will there? Well, yeah, yeah. If, the, if, the, 
they've got union money behind them and they can buy votes and, or buy signatures, certainly they'll get it. I mean, that's how it works I mean, in Michigan. So, so, so part of what's going on here is, and no one's right about this part of it, it's, it's an election year, and mm -hmm. you've got to get Democrats to the polls. The only reason Rick Snyder uh, won in 2010 and the only reason the legislature went completely Republican was that you had 250 to 300,000 Democrat and independent votes, voters sit home. You can't repeat that this year. And there is some concern uh, about uh, the candidates that the Democrats are likely to field being able to, to move those numbers. Uh, so if you can't do it with your candidates or if you're unsure that you're going to do it with your candidates, you do it with ballot initiatives. And this is a ballot initiative that will play very well with the Democratic base. I, my concern would be how does it play with independent voters uh, mm. uh, who how do you may think it not... Does, how do you think it does play? I mean, know, I'm not sure it plays as... I, it certainly doesn't play as strongly as it does with with those in the Democratic base. This is a very, very Democratic issue. Uh, you need independent voters, though, to, to, to believe that, you know, enough of them to believe that this is a, a good thing, to have it affect other races. You know, it was very interesting. I uh, moderated a community conversation that we do with the Center for Michigan, and it, one of the large things was minimum wage that people yeah. were talking about. Yeah, that well, it, people are know. hurting. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's pretty... It's pretty callous to, to, to not acknowledge the pain that people uh, who once considered themselves middle or, or you know upper lower class uh, are feeling because of the recession and the slow recovery. I mean, we, we are in a position where we are creating uh, far too far too much of a gap between uh, those at the upper end of the income uh, scale and those at the. Well, you're not going to help them by jacking up the minimum wage. You're going to hurt them. Because instead of making 740 an hour, they're going to make zero. Well, I mean, there's an a hour. lot of, and, it's, and, it's and, certainly you know, you not. Just, that's just not. Well, that's not the way to do it. And why not set the minimum wage at 25 dollars an hour? Because well, 10 dollars an hour is not going to give you a middle class income either. It's not, but uh, it's also it's also not as as clear a one to one correlation as you're saying. Raising the minimum wage doesn't just uh, uh, eliminate jobs. It does a lot of other things in the economy. It puts more money into consumers' pockets. Poor people spend mo much more of what they earn than wealthy people do. So when you raise their incomes, you grow you grow consumer demand. Uh, this is why things like the earned income tax credit and other low income uh, aids I would agree are with so the important. Earned income tax credit, but when you're when you're telling employers that okay, we are going to set the wages for your business. But we do that anyway, regardless of what, of of your ability to pay or the profitability of your business or the productivity of your workers, that's getting but way... But we do it anyway. I mean, that's, that's why we have... Involved in and it's going to be, it's gonna be interesting to see in if the there's going to be the political will to, to get this done. And, the, and um, President Obama said he signed an executive order to raise the minimum wage for, for federal, federal contracted workers, workers yeah. um, this week at the State of the Union. Stephen, you were at the State of the Union this week. Uh, kind of give me your impressions because not everyone gets to go see Steve the State met of the, the Duck Union. Dynasty. <laughs> I, I was me. looking for you. I was looking for you in the crowd, and that was the most exciting <laughs> thing for Nolan to hear guy. that you, could, you met the guy from Duck I Dynasty. I did. We stood in line together to get into the into the gallery. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty cool to sit there and you know, I mean. You, they, they open the door and they say, "Ladies and gentlemen, the you know, or the Mr. Speaker, the the President of the United States." And he comes walking through the door and shakes all the hands. Uh, it's not a big room, obviously. There's not a lot of people there, so I was very grateful to to be there. Thanks to John Dingle, uh, who helped get me the ticket, and Speaker Boehner, who the ticket came from. So. Next week, Steve's beard will be out. <laughs> That's right. I'm gonna I'm gonna be the Duck Dynasty guy. <laughs> All right. Now. So let me just, in the quick time that we have left on this topic, give, give me your impressions of, uh, of the, the speech. Of, yeah, of the speech. You know, it was a, it was a very uh, it was a very good democratic speech, right? This was rallying the base of the party around core issues uh, and sort of getting them back in line. I mean, there's a lot of uh, disaffection, I think, among Democrats and liberals with this administration and, and what it's been able to deliver on. This was intended to get them worked up again. Uh, and it was also a challenge, I thought, a very clear challenge to Congress to say, you guys don't do very much, uh, and it's not going to matter to me that much anymore. I'm going to go and do the things that I can do. If you want to come along, uh, so be it. If not, then you'll seem like uh, you're not you're not working. Does Congress take that challenge, or well, do the they ignore is, him this week? The problem is, is this president thinks there's nothing he can't do. He's completely willing to ignore the Constitution and the limits on his power. And I think there's going to reach a point where America says, "Wait a minute, we didn't elect a king here. We didn't elect a dictator. The people's representatives have a pay, have a, have a voice in this in this whole thing." You, you have to remember, 63 percent of the country now have no confidence in him to make the right decisions 
elections for the country. That's not a good time to go off unilaterally <laughs> and start putting well, an how agenda much, in that do you, the, do you that the people don't want. With the executive no. order? I, I, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, Article 2 of the Constitution is uh, about as uh, robust as Article 1, which outlines what Congress can do. And, and uh, the, the relationship there is often defined by lack of action, right? Uh, Congress has say over things where it chooses to act. It doesn't have say over things where it doesn't choose. Well, that's not the a, executive that's, does. That's an absolute misinterpretation. Absolutely the president not. has no right to say, well, Congress doesn't want to do this. I'll right. do it anyway. And in many cases, this president has acted in defiance of Congress's action. This president has done where has they've done act, where they've specifically said we're not doing this, and he's done it anyway. And what the Constitution do, doesn't no, allow what that. What he can't state. do is what he can't do is defy what they've decided to do. He has a lot of dream act. He has a lot of he has a lot of that's that's an executive order issue. That's a but that's it was a done after of, Congress had already said it's an no. interpretation of of Cap the law. And trade over and over. Yeah. He's ask, acting against the will of Congress. The Constitution does not for allow starters, that separation. Of for power starters, does he's not done it a lot that. less than George W. Bush did, who signed but far he was more. But allowed to do the, the executive order. All right, we'll, we'll continue this conversation. I'm sure in the weeks <laughs> to come.